Welcome to Life in the Law. I'm Kara Mon Lee, your host today with my special guest, nationally known Honolulu lawyer, Sherry Broder, the first woman president of the Hawaii State Bar Association. Sherry's been an award-winning solo practitioner for years, concentrating in complex litigation. Her legal work also includes international law, environmental law, and rights of Native Hawaiians, among other areas. She teaches law at UH Richardson School of Law and is the founder of the John Van Dyke Institute of International Law and Justice. She publishes and is also an active community volunteer. Her underlying goal is always seeking social justice. For decades, she has represented torture victims who suffered during the Ferdinand Marcos regime. It's been a long haul and recently it's been in the news again. So Sherry, tell us a little bit about the history of the infamous Marcos case and what's <laughs> been happening. Well, in 1986, Ferdinand Marcos came here to Hawaii. Uh, he was overthrown in the People's Revolution. He was a dictator. He was a, had a military dictatorship in, in the Philippines. In the Philippines. So he had been elected in 1972, but uh, when the time came for him to step down, because it's a six-year constitutional term in the Philippines, he declared martial law and imposed a dictatorship, dissolved the judiciary, dissolved the legislature. So when he came here to Hawaii, there had been reports, many, many reports of human rights abuses in the Philippines. And I thought, well, why does he get to come to our beautiful state, probably live on the beach with all the money he's stolen from the Filipino people? Uh, why doesn't he go to, you know, Paraguay or... Argentina and live with Mengele and Eichmann and other human <laughs> rights other abusers. Right. So I talked to my husband, who was a professor of international law. And both my husband and I had studied at Berkeley Law School with Professor Frank Newman. He was very into uh, human rights, international human rights. And so we talked about it and decided, okay, we're going to sue him while well, he's here for human rights abuses during the military dictatorship. So you had a jurisdiction over him because he moved to Hawaii as opposed to any other place. Exactly. I see. Okay. So he and his wife? They were both here. Uh -huh. uh, we sued him. And then I read... Was that unusual to be able to sue an, an individual dictator like that? I mean, has that, had that been done before? You know, this was just part of the developing law. Uh, there had been a case, this was 1986, so there had been a case in 1982, Phil Ortega case, that the Second Circuit, the Federal Court of Appeals, had found that the Phil Ortega family could sue the torturer and murderer of their son, who was in the Paraguayan military police force at the time. They were walking down the streets of New York City and they saw him. So they ran out and sued him. So that was really the first case. And the Second Circuit Court of Appeals upheld jurisdiction over the dictator. So we decided to follow the Phil Ortega case. And we talked to Professor Belinda Aquino, who was head of Philippine Studies at UH at the time. And she helped us, put us together with Agapita Trujano. Her son had been picked up at the college that he was attending by the security forces for Aimi Marcos. So this is in the Philippines. This is in the, in the Philippines. This is in 1976. And he was picked up by the bodyguards for Aimi. And the next time anybody saw him, he had br brutally tortured uh, cigarette burns, and he, you know, he had been executed, basically. This is Professor Aquino's son. No, this is Professor Aquino's uh, re outreach into the Filipino community I in see. Hawaii. It was Agapita Trujano's son. I see. Uh, Archimedes Trujano. And so we filed a lawsuit on behalf of, the, of Mrs. Trujano. And then I read in the New York Times that Robert Swift of Philadelphia had filed a class action lawsuit on behalf of everybody that was tortured, murdered, and disappeared. And so, well, of course I wanted to do that, represent <laughs> everybody, not just the one person. 
So I called Bob and I said, hey, you know, the case is probably going to be transferred here to Hawaii. And, you know, if you want to co-counsel, let me know. And, of course, the case was transferred here to Hawaii. So we, we joined forces. Uh, we were up on appeal. So Marcos was still alive at that time? He was still alive. And at living time. in Hawaii. And living in Hawaii, uh -huh. exactly. Yeah, so we... Um, the first thing that happened was the case was dismissed by the federal uh, trial judge for active state, exactly for the reason that you brought up to begin with, which is, can you sue a former head of state? He may have been a dictator, but, you know, he was a head of state uh, while, you know, after he's out of office. So that, the judge dismissed it on the active state doctrine, and then that case went up on appeal. That was... The Trujano case was run first mm -hmm. on these issues, and that case went up on appeal to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit ruled, yes, you can, if he's a former head of state. So, for instance, in more recent years, um, uh, Mugabe, who was also a military dictator in um, Zimbabwe, he came to a meeting at the United Nations, and he was sued, but he was at that time still act head of state. And so the courts ruled that you couldn't sue him. Until he went out of, he went out of office. Was well, out they of office. didn't say when you could. Yeah. They just said you can't sue him while he's presently head of state. So we sued him, and then the cases went forward. We had what you call a trifurcated trial, where the trial went on over like a year and a half period, but in segments. So first we tried liability. and. We established in the civil context the concept of uh, command responsibility. Okay, so at the Nuremberg trials, that's in the criminal context, and at the Tokyo trials though, after World War II, those trials against the German, German uh, head officers and the Japanese head officers were based on whether or not they would have criminal liability under command responsibility. So in other words, if they weren't actually there killing people at the massacre themselves, or if they weren't actually present at Auschwitz, were they still responsible if they were giving the orders? Right. And they were responsible for the troops. And so this was in the first time in the civil context. So this was not a criminal case at all. Your cases were all civil cases. Yes. Very different in terms of ultimate um, uh, right right in a civil case, the case right in a civil case we were seeking money damages for As our clients in a criminal jail. yeah mm -hmm. or i mean in the tokyo cases and the nuremberg cases a lot of people got the death penalty right. yeah right. okay so let's fast forward a little bit because here we're talking about 1980s now right yes so over the course of the period it went to i know the supreme court so, okay, we, we did the trifurcated trial. We got a $2 billion verdict. So that was actually in the 90s. So we are okay, moving ahead. Move, okay. okay, $2 billion. Now, that's a very big judgment. Yes. At the, at the time, it was the biggest judgment in the United States. So it was a class action. Yeah. And that was a big deal then. It was a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. So then we uh, proceeded to try to collect on the judgment. And... We pursued the house that the Marcoses lived in up in Makiki Heights, and we did get a settlement. It was in the name of the Tantokos, who were their cronies. And the Marcoses were experts at hiding their wealth because, as you can see today, they continued to be fabulously wealthy. And their son, Bong Bong, ran for vice president of the Philippines. Their daughter, Aimi, uh, became governor of Ilocos Norte, and now she just got elected senator. And uh, Imelda herself got elected to uh, office. But in the Philippines, well, the same is true here. If you want to run for national office like that, you really need a lot of money. You need a lot of money. But the judgments then that came down came against not the three of them personally. Was it against? So who was the actual defendant? Was it the... Okay, the, the defendant was the estate of Ferdinand Marcos. Well, okay. initially Ferdinand Marcos, but then when he died, Passed it was away. against the estate. But the personal representatives of the estate became uh, the son, Bong Bong, and the wife, Imelda. 
And so we tried so many different ways to get information from them about where are the assets and, you know, so that we could go collect on the assets. And they would never provide us with any information. And so a contempt judgment ran against them in federal court uh, for all the time all the many years in which they wouldn't provide any information. And the judge gave them many chances to disclose. But then in the end, we reduced the, the fine for failure to disclose any information about their assets to judgment. And we have a $350 million judgment against the two of them, which has gone up on appeal to the Ninth Circuit, and the Ninth Circuit upheld their judgment. So you still have the $2 billion judgment against the estate, and in addition, you have $350 million against them individually, the two um, estate uh, trustees? Are they, well, they are they're representatives. representatives. Okay. Yeah. And they moved back to the Philippines after right. Ferdinand Marcos passed away. Right. I see. What year was that? Oh, I can't remember what year they went back. But they've been, you know, the Marcoses constantly, you know, deny anything about what happened. And, uh, you know, they've been very successful in running for office. Sure. So tell us a little bit about the chase for finding some of the money. I know you have found some all over the world. Okay, so we, we did collect on the Makiki Heights house. We sold the Mercedes, the bulletproof Mercedes that Marcos drove around in when he lived in Hawaii at, at public auction. It was bought by the owner of the Imperial Palace in Las Vegas who has a... <laughs> I was afraid we wouldn't sell it because I would like, you know, it's kind of black memorabilia. But I guess there are people who are into it. And that guy had Hitler's, you know, VW oh. bunk, too. So uh, <laughs> The dictator's cars. <laughs> yeah, the dictator's cars. So he had it on display full of shoes. So if you, if you went and you could guess the Amount right of number shoes. of shoes, you could. Well, they weren't really her shoes. Oh. But you could, you could get a free spin at the roulette wheel, I guess. So I know you found some money in Switzerland. We did. We found money in Switzerland, $650 million, and we litigated in Switzerland over that money. You know, the law in Switzerland really protects the banking industry and the bankers, and so it's a crime in Switzerland to divulge any banking information. Uh, but we, we did pursue that money. Uh, we, actually, there were, we actually had a... Uh, mediation in Hong Kong with uh, Bong Bong and the Philippine government and ourselves over the division of those assets. And we did arrive at a, an agreement. We were supposed to, our clients were supposed to receive $150 million. And the president of the Philippines agreed, uh, but uh, the, the, the PCGG, which is the Presidential Commission on Good Government, Disagreed. Anyways, it was fighting in the Philippines over it, and so the deal fell apart. So in these cases, did Bong Bong and Imelda, did they show up actually in these court proceedings? Were they represented by counsel? Of course, by counsel, but did they actually attend the hearings too? Well, they attended the mediation in oh, Hong mediation. Kong. I, I didn't want the mediation in the United States, uh, but they yeah. attended there. Mm -hmm. And um, generally, uh, they've, they've had lawyers here in mm -hmm. Hawaii for... All the federal cases, there was a state case against them, too, by some other uh, attorneys, and they, they had sent a lawyer for that. We've deposed Imelda many times, mm -hmm. and we deposed Bong Bong as well, and they've, right. they've shown up for the depositions. And I know you found some artwork, too, right? Okay, so our, the first major re recovery was... In Texas. I'm sorry if you don't mind. But well, no. I'm going to get okay. there. We're going to go to break in All a right. few seconds, so if you can. All right, tell so us in Texas. A few seconds. Okay, so these assets were in the name of Campos, who mm -hmm. was also a crony of Marcos. And there was an incredible big spread in Texas, but some of the land included petroleum. Uh, so we pursued that case, uh, went up on appeal as well, and then. Finally, we settled with Campos for $10 million. Okay, great. Well, on that note, we're going to go to a short break. When we come back from the okay. break, we're going to talk about the actual amounts that we've been, you've been able to distribute to the victims of torture from Mark. So we'll be right back. This is Carol Mon Lee on Life in the Law with my special guest, Sherry Broder. 
Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go Beyond the Lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. <laughs> Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Welcome back. This is Carol Mon Lee and Life in the Law with my special guest, Sherry Broder. And we're talking about the compensation to victims from the Marcos dictatorship uh, and his uh, years of torturing uh, Filipino citizens. So thank you, Sherry. So we talked the first half about the case and how it got to this point over since 1986 and the class action and the chase for the money. So exactly, you said uh, you had a judgment for three billion, but how much are, have you been able to actually find and collect? Okay, well the judgment was for two billion. For two billion. That's okay though. It's One billion, two billion. Three yeah, billion. it's <laughs> close enough. Uh, we've actually collected approximately forty million dollars. So first we collected the house up at Makiki Heights, a million dollars mm -hmm. from that. Sold the Mercedes at public auction. We collected some money from a Picasso that uh, was, had been sold by uh, one of the main auction houses in New York. We also collected $10 million from compost for the properties in Texas. Mm -hmm. Then we found that uh, a Monet painting, a Monet water lilies, had been sold in New York City by Vilma Bautista, the former uh, uh, secretary. Uh -huh. For, Vil, for Imelda Marcos, and I guess she was such a good secretary that Imelda gave, gave her, her a painting, <laughs> a which she then turned around and sold, you know, 35 years, 30 years later for um, $34 million. So, you know, she must have been super exceptional secretary. Right. So that you had a total of, uh, you have a pool then of $40 million that you can distribute among how many people are in the class? How many victims have you identified? There's approximately 7,500 people who, are, who have opted into the class. So that's kind of a class action, federal rule complication uh, opt-in. But you had to sign up to be a member of our class. And, and of we, course, these were victims of abuse. They had somehow been able to prove that they had been tortured in some way. They had to fill out uh, an affidavit claiming, you know, explaining their claims. and. At the trial, we, we had a statistician describe how many people we would need to actually interview and talk to uh, uh, and have their testimony considered during the trial in order to have a statistically significant sample and what the plus or minus error would be. Because obviously, there would be no way. A lot of our clients are very poor. There would be no way we could have tried the case for 7,500 people. I mean, we would have no, taken not individual. Yeah. Okay. But, so, but uh, what happens, it's been so long, I'm sure some of them have passed away, so is their states can step into their shoes as victims? Well, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Of course, the case to begin with is for torture. Well, those victims can still be alive. But for those victims who were summarily executed, they call it salvaged, and those victims who are disappeared, mm -hmm. those people weren't available to even file a claim. Okay, so they don't get any of the proceeds? No, they, the, do. they, they do. Can, their okay. relatives can file claims. Okay, yes. all right. So now you've collected $40 million and you've already distributed some money, you said, in the past? Yes, so this, I was just returned a couple of weeks ago and from the Philippines, the distribution. That was our third distribution. First, we distributed in um, 2013, 
2010, that was the money from the settlement in Texas, the money from Makiki Heights, the Mercedes, the Picasso. So we did our first distribution then. That was $1,000 each. To about 7,000 people? About, uh -huh. yes. And then we, distrib we did a second distribution in 2013, and that was from the settlement we had. We sued the hedge fund manager who lived in Switzerland who had bought the water lilies one painting for $34 million. But in our opinion, you know, where's the providence for that painting? And why did <clears throat> a Monet only cost $34 million? I mean, that, for Monet, that's not very much. Uh, so we had funds from our settlement with him. And then the most recent one, the most recent settlement, which was for $14 million, was due to, there were other, turns out, other paintings and rugs and insurance policies and cash and other things in this warehouse in where the Monet had been kept. Stored, uh huh? So you turn that into cash. And then that's what's been making the news this last couple of weeks, and I was even yes. on the national news, is that um, your distribution. So can we show some pictures? We got some slides of Sherry and her team's recent trip. So this first picture is um, a coastline and some ships, uh, some boats. Tell us about where we are in the Philippines. Okay, we're in Samar, western Samar, which is in Leyte province. Uh, so, you know, that's where Imelda is actually from, but from a different part of the province. I mean, I was, I was heartbroken at how poor the people are. I mean, you can see, you know, how they're living. That's beachfront property in Samar. And then they go out in these, fish, these boats to go fishing every day, but you can see they don't have a motor. So they're going out, working all day long. That's uh, so their living, right, is to fish. Yeah. Yet they don't have motors. So the money that we've been able to give them will, you know, enable them to buy a motor. So right. that'll make a, a big difference in their lives. I also took the picture because I'm very involved in uh, trying to work on stopping plastic pollution. So here I am in the remote part of the Philippines in this plastic uh, Is that lining you the picking beach. Up plastic, I see. No, no, that's not no. Me picking <laughs> okay. up plastic. But yeah, okay. so I was very upset about that too. Right, and so our next slide is a street theme. You know, maybe this is something we should consider here in Honolulu, getting around on scooters instead of everybody driving cars. But right. the reason they're doing that, of course, is they can't afford anything else. But this is, I would say, 90% of the transportation around Samar is in these jeepneys. You see the scooter with a little um, thing over it. Attachment, yeah. right. I mean, they can put, you know, they could stuff people in that. I I even saw somewhere people were sitting on the roof and they're they're getting around. So there's enough money for somebody to buy a jeepney too and right. So this maybe is an the Uber community. Driver and, so this is because you chose this community to distribute checks because we we have different locations where we distribute checks. We pick them based on the you know the number of clients in a vicinity. And otherwise we do two distributions in Manila. So, you know, everybody can come there. Right. But a lot of these people can't afford to travel, travel all the way to Manila. Right. But in Samar, oh, my God, the stories that I heard when I was there, I just, just break your heart. You know, some people, they, come, they came, and they, the military or the constabulary, and they took two of their sons, you know, 14, 16 years old, never to be seen again. Oh. If you and can this was imagine. in the 80s, in the 70s and 80s. This was in the 80s. 80s, my goodness. Yeah. Now we have another couple of slides. One is, um, this is a group of people waiting. And what are they waiting for? This is for... Okay, so, you know, we had to make sure that everybody who, uh, you know, came to claim a check was, in fact, the person mm -hmm. they said they were. Right. And that they matched our database uh, that they had the proper documentation. If they're coming as heirs, as opposed to the victim themselves, then we wanted to know, like, what did the rest of the family say? Was this the designated person to pick up the check? So they're, they're going through a whole process uh, of validation. Up, yeah. Right. And so in the in, uh, earlier uh, distributions, we had taken pictures of people that came in to claim checks, so we could also compare the pictures. Identify. Yeah, but you know, the people, uh, it's just, 
you know, I felt like, you know, the people are so poor, those with the wealth own everything. So these people are living in the middle of a huge forest, but the wealthy own all the land. So they can't even go in the forest and cut down a tree to build a house. Uh, they're very uneducated. Mm -hmm. Some of our clients can't sign their name. Not only can they not read, they can't sign their own name. So a lot of the special power of attorneys were by thumbprint. Oh my goodness. Okay, our next picture, our next slide. This is uh, Sherry with a group of people, and who are we looking at here? Okay, so there's me on, uh, yeah, on the far right. I guess I'm wearing the same shirt. <laughs> and pearls, too. <laughs> yeah, and pearls. <laughs> I do have more clothes, but... <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, um, so I was wearing that, and then the person on the opposite side for me, Claire, she was our translator. Uh, so this part of the Philippines, uh, not only do most people sort of speak at least Tagalog, but a lot of people, there's an, you know, an indigenous language there, Ray Ray, and she's actually from this part of the Philippines. Mm -hmm. She's very well educated, a, a school teacher, and Mm -hmm. retired now and so she works for the Commission on Human Rights I see which is in the Philippines and we coordinated a lot with them and then the woman in the middle is the claimant and her uh, two uh, you know granddaughters and uh, she is a victim and she's oh, a my victim. goodness yeah. right okay we have two more slides let's get to the next one ah this is you and shaking hands with a recipient? I'm shaking hands with a claimant. So this uh -huh. is victim. And you can see uh, he came with his granddaughter. You know, that was so impressive. I would ask people, what are you going to do with the money? If it was, especially if it was a victim themselves. Right. And they pretty much either they were going to pay for their grandchild's education or they were going to fix the house, which they were living with, with all their relatives. My goodness. So, yeah. Wow. So people were... Mm. I was very moved, of course, meeting the people. And our last, our very last picture is your team. Yeah, there's the team. And uh, so the guy uh, the, uh, the, opposite the me standing. in the far left standing, that's Bob Swift. That's uh -huh. my co-counsel. Then you can see Claire in the front again. Our on the translator. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then on the left, uh, that woman is a lawyer in the Philippines, and she is... Uh, one of the people heading up the Commission on Human Rights office in Samar. Uh, you can see me over there right. in the green. And the woman in the matching green, Zina, yeah. she, uh, she was an invaluable help. She's in the, she was in the Commission for Human Rights uh, office in Manila. Okay, great. Well, we just have a few more seconds left. So what exactly is the next step? Will there be another distribution soon? Or have you given out all the forty million that you've collected so far? We've given out all the funds that we've collected. Uh -huh. or we're in the process of finishing uh -huh. that uh, giving out. But we have another case in New York, uh, over forty million dollars, and that case even went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. But we're still litigating over that. So we're hoping, and we intend to have more distribution. Great. And on that note, we look forward to hearing from you again next time there is another distribution, and uh, having you come back to. To tell us more about this uh, very important case and the uh, opportunity that you have to at least give back to some of these people some of the money that at least that they deserve. So thank you so much, Sherry Broder. She, Sherry Broder has been my guest today on Think Tech Hawaii: Life and the Law, and we've been talking about compensation to victims uh, uh, from the Marcos regime. So we'll see you next time. Aloha. Mm -hmm.